And we are live. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the episode of Global Citizens. My name is Calvin. I'm the show's kid host and also its creator. So my guest for today is somebody that is really, really special in how I actually started on doing all of this. So in case you guys have ever read it before, I used to write a lot of articles in the earlier part of 2019. And one of the articles was actually published by George himself. So George here is somebody that is known in the tech community as the Bitcoin Bitcoin creature. He is the managing director of Aya, and he is, of course, the third culture kid. So how are you, buddy? Welcome to the show. Yeah, doing good, man. Good to be here. All right. Uh, George, mind just sharing us a bit on your TC quest, as in how you met on your background, how you started? Because uh, I know that well is that you have too many whenever I ask, where are you from, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for, for all the fellow TCKs, the general answer to that is my mother is, uh, my dad is Fijian Indian. My mother is Tuvaluan Samoan. Uh, I have an Australian citizenship. I uh, was there for about eight years from two to eight, uh, sorry, six years. And then I moved to Bangladesh and went to an American international school there for about 10 years. Um, so the accent is from that part of the world um, and that's school. And then, uh, yeah, went back to Australia, but now I'm based in Singapore. That's where I have my uh, company incorporated. All right. All right, George. So my very first question is actually a combination of something that I usually ask at the later part. And I'm sorry, buddy, you're going to hit me in the very first part. So first is, how do you define home first? And second is that this is related to something that you and I love. We both are a big fan of the Avatar series. What positive traits that you acquire from your different parts of the country? So it's just like what what happened if Uncle Iroh learned, learned how to water bed and created lightning bending. <laughs> love that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so how do I define home? Uh, you know, there's a saying, right? Like home is where the heart is. And yeah. um, for me, home is definitely not about place per se. And I think for any fellow TCK, like we've really just felt at home when we're either around other fellow TCKs or just the people. Right. Yeah. So it hasn't really mattered too much for me, uh, which place I've been in. It's actually been wherever there are more of us around um, people yeah. who understand, you know, the sort of uh, third culture kid, global citizen aspect. And uh, Singapore is, is filled with, you know, a lot of TCKs um, and a lot of people who have sort of that mentality. So it's been when I when I came here, uh, when I came back again, in 2018, it just felt like, you know what, this is this is where I need to be right now. Um, even if I, I'm, I'm still working quite a bit, um, but just being able to know that, like, I got a lot of other fellow TCKs just around the corner, and uh, it really does feel more like home because of that. So, if a whole bunch of these folks like just decided to leave, you know, um, then Singapore would cease to feel like home. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's on the home part. And uh, in terms of what I've learned from each place, I think definitely Fiji, um, my roots. You know, so my mom is always, was always pretty uh, good at uh, reminding us of our uh, Polynesian uh, roots. So culturally, I, I'm more aligned to that side than probably my father's side. Yeah. Um, my father's side, I didn't really learn more about until I was much older. Um, so that's unlike the Indian side. And uh, a lot of, you know, sort of identity uh, issues growing up. Uh, my yearbook at, in, at school, every year I put a different country because I didn't know which one to put down. Because everybody had one country, you know, that they put down usually. But I think uh, as we got older, we realized that it's okay, you know, to actually have multiple countries that you, you say you're from. Uh, Australia, hmm, Australia, what have I learned from there? Uh, probably that's where I learned more of the Western cultural values, um, I'd say. And I think, yeah, a big part that's pro probably what, what I learned. And then in Bangladesh, I think I just learned what it's like to be in a country where you do not have everything. Uh, yeah. You know, even though we were at a, at a private school, um, a, a part of the expat community, you know, there were still a lot of things that we did to interact with like locals and villages and slums and stuff. And it was always humbling for us to, to be reminded of that, of where we are and to never really take things for granted. So, and then being in that environment also made us, uh, I think I definitely learned more about how to be accepting of other cultures. 
So yeah, Uncle Iroh, right? Like you must learn <laughs> from all the all the different uh, nations um, and you know blend them and bring them together to make them your own. So obviously, fire is a, a very strong element of mine. But I've definitely learned, you know, different aspects, and I continue to, you know, when I go to different countries, I'm I always enjoy learning about like the local history, the local culture, uh, the local arts, um, even the economics, you know, um, of that place. So that that definitely ha has been um, a common theme, you know, uh, learning to respect people of uh, different uh, beliefs, different religions, uh, different viewpoints. You're just forced to. Um, because I wasn't in my, you know, home country um, of where I was born. So you always have to learn how to, to adapt and blend in. And then at the same time, learning how to stay true to who you are, which took a long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. All right, Malik. Uh, okay. So have you ever experienced, okay, sorry. In this show, we don't like to call it a failure. It's called a learning opportunity. So have you ever experienced a unique learning opportunity because of cultural misunderstanding? And what have you done since then to ensure that you stick to your roots, man? Hmm. So it was a question, uh, like a learning opportunity, a big learning yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh, uh. Um, I think probably when I went, when I went back to Australia, right? So it was funny, I remember in school, our superintendent, you know, went home country, and because uh, I'm an Australian citizen, that's supposed to be my home, uh, that you, you know, you might not feel like you fit in. And that wasn't cemented until I did go back to Australia. And there, there was this thing of like reverse culture shock. You know, a lot of people have culture shock going into a new culture, but then it's like when you go back, you're not the same anymore. You know, yep. so all the things that you might have related to friends and family on beforehand, now all of a sudden your eyes have been opened and um, you see the world differently and you cannot just go back to how you saw the world. So I think the learning opportunity came in uh, at that point of really, I guess, cementing my identity, you know, yep. and, and, and that was when I became more comfortable with saying, like, I am from all these different places. Because I think before then, I was trying to put myself into one category because that's what everybody else is doing, right? And that's what you're taught to do. Uh, you know, every country, uh, typically if you've lived in that place, a uh, great sense of pride to say you're from this country. But the reality is that we're all mixed, you know, in some way, shape or form. Uh, the yep. national identity, uh, that's a cultural thing, right? But, you know, Singapore is a perfect example of this because their roots are based on like four main different cultures. Um, already they were quite mixed from the get-go. So they more than anything understand the um, importance of acknowledging all parts, you know? And that's reflected from the architecture to the, um, the, the different religious uh, buildings that are around. Uh, there's a, there's a there's tolerance. There's even a monument to commemorate it. Yep, ex exactly, you know? So I know, so I would say yeah, my learning opportunity was, was there at that point where, you know, because I think a lot of TCKs go through that of like trying to figure out who am I, you know? Um, yeah. And <laughs> there's a quote from uh, Uncle Iroh as well, right? When he's talking to Zuko, it's like, who, Zuko, <laughs> who are you and who do you uh, want to be, um, right? And it's like, you have to ask those questions to yourself. And I think those, that question um, I had to ask myself uh, when I went back to Australia, going through uni, Everybody had their cliques, you know, and they've just like grown up since young together, right? So yeah. no new, no new friends really. Um, but for those of us who have been constantly moving around or had friends leave us because you know they've only been uh, stationed with their family for two years or so, yeah. So I would say that was probably like the learning opportunity. Right. Okay, for those of you who just did it to the show for the very first time, uh, Global Citizens is a show whereby I invited, invited individuals for TCK like George and myself, uh, expatriates, nomads, and basically anyone who has experienced a multicultural life. Because as what George has mentioned, we, unlike when you enter a new country, maybe you're there for a visit or a holiday, yes, you are exposed to a new culture. However, you are there as a visitor you will only experience it for a period of time. And in fact, it may be something that it's so delightful to you. 
However, if you are those like us who are of multicultural background, when you enter a country, you are there as part of the country. You need to adapt to them. You need to accept their culture as part of yours. You may experience issues that's not considered a norm, and as a result, it become a part of you. So the ups and the downs is one that forms who you are. Right, buddy. Uh, okay, so uh, sorry, uh, I might sound like I think I'm just asking a lot of pop culture, but I think this is a lot of things that you and I love a lot. So this is actually something with a recent trend in pop in popular culture. So. Recently, the, from 2016, there's a lot of medias that actually portrays the Polynesian culture in a, in a large part. Like, like, for example, Boada. In fact, uh, I actually put as one of the trivia for your part is actually the creation of Maui was created based on one of uh, 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 the rock's grandfather, High Chief Peter by, by Via, who is also a Samoan High Chief. And in fact, that, create, that character is created based on the rock himself. So, okay, with regard, and of course, there's Aquaman, Jason Boboa, who is now one of the top guys in the Hollywood. So, how do you feel this greater pop culture and exposure for less known mythology of Samoan heritage benefit, benefit for the younger generation of those who is Polynesian culture? Yeah, I mean, I wish um, I should have uh, brought my picture. I've got a framed picture actually of my family. When Moana came out, we all went. So you know, in the foe, which is like the flowers around the um, the, the head garland, and um, you know, it was a real uh, source of pride for us. And you know, the interesting thing about like I guess my Polynesian roots is there's so many of us that have moved to other countries, right? So from say Fiji or Samoa, you either go to like Hawaii, um, New Zealand, Australia, the U.S. So. One thing that I think the Polynesians do very well is that no matter where they go, they do keep a very strong sense of their Polynesian roots, right, and that culture, um, but still also acknowledging all the mixes. You know, that, that's I think that's what I love about that side um, of my heritage. And I think for the next generation, representation is a damn good thing for all. You know, I think in Hollywood we we know that um, it, it, it had been predominantly white in the past. Um, and then, you know, with uh, folks like Bruce Lee coming into Hollywood, right, then we got more yeah. Asian representation. And still today, right, like we're still looking, um, what was it, Parasite, right? They, they won an Emmy. Yeah, what was they it? won an uh, Oscar, Oscar. Oscar, Oscar, my God, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, that was awesome to see, you know. And I think with um, new platforms like Netflix, I love seeing the fact that they have a lot of, like, international series and films that are being um, exposed to different audiences. That people are really interested in like for example yeah. my mom she's walking she's watching like this <laughs> lot really insanely long turkish drama like crime drama right and it's in a complete other language but she's so invested because she just loves everything about it um but going back to the polynesian side uh yeah extremely proud you know um to, especially seeing folks like the rock dwayne johnson um we've got uh, jason momoa and then we also have um Oh, Taika Waititi. Um, yeah, Taika Waititi. Yeah, white. Yeah, so he he also is coming up. You know, um, I love his like the um, the New Zealand sense of humor. You know, is uh, I love it. Um, and so it's good to see more of those type of films come out. Um, and just yeah, again, you know, I think for Polynesians, uh, they've been typically relegated to like sports in the past, at least on a global stage, right? So rugby, you know, being a rugby, big one. Yeah. And. Um, I think it is so important for us to have, you know, Polynesians in different parts. So right now we have, they've gone into sports and then entertainment, you know, um, naturally. And uh, I, I'm now in the fintech space and uh, we're dealing with, you know, uh, Bitcoin integration stuff. And uh, that would be a separate topic. But in that space, you know, I'm like one of the few um, dark skin brothers, you know, if I, I put it straight. And um, I think we we need more of that. And I had a fellow uh, Tongan friend of mine who was here in Singapore, um, and he's like awesome on the social media front, right? He worked for an agency, like he was one of the first like um, chief happiness officers for Twitter, like when Twitter was on the rise. Yeah, um, his uh, Twitter handle is at iconic eighty eight, and um, you know him and I we both uh, we both met at a conference where it was yeah you know, predominantly white. And we were the only two brown brothers there. 
And I was so happy to see like a, a fellow Islander up on stage, you know? And again, it's just being able to see that diversity like reflected in your environments. And um, one thing I've acknowledged too, is that you can't expect that everywhere too, because of course they're gonna be just, you know, small local centers areas where like it's going to have a majority of like more race one race or culture you know understandably but i do like to surround myself in environments where that diversity is reflected um hence a place you know like singapore um yeah all right cool man yeah i can relate to a lot of it in fact uh yeah the, although i wish when it comes to representation it has more than like for us asians it's like Unless it's like we all have to know math or we are good at Kung Fu. So I can really wish there's a lot of better representation of that. In fact, the, the next year, Marvel is releasing a movie called Sang Chi, but the character was actually inspired by Bruce Lee back then. So yeah, of course, it's going to be doing Kung Fu. So, uh, but at least, yeah, it's good to see the representation part. And yeah, I don't know what to mention about Parasite. Uh, in fact, I posted it on both my books, business page and my own personal page, because I was really proud of that, since it's an Asian-based movie. All right. I actually want to dip in a little bit more for your life work uh, with Fire. Yeah? So what do you think is more important in today's society, goal or data, and why? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that last last bit? Oh, sorry. Uh, which one is more important in today's society, gold or data, and why? <laughs> uh, did you say which one's more important, gold or or da data? D -A -G -A. Or data, data. Ooh, wow! Very <laughs> good question, brother. Um, fuck. I hmm. It depends. There's a few things uh, on the line here, right? I think. Yeah. I mean. A, a good investor would hedge hedge themselves. So, you know, um, they'd have gold and also be building businesses that leverage the data side. Um, yeah. Right now, of course, uh, assuming that the internet always stays on, uh, data definitely is the, the new gold, um, or at least what has the most value, right? And I think that's why I find myself in the, the blockchain space, uh, and, and especially with, with Bitcoin. And so, when I refer to Bitcoin, I refer, I'm referring to currently what is um, BSV. So most people don't know that there's like three versions of Bitcoin out at the moment. And there's a lot of politics, I won't go into it. But uh, when I'm referring to Bitcoin, I'm referring to BSV. And essentially what uh, I've seen there that actually relates to my TCK-ness is that I always felt like there should be a global currency of some sort. Um, I think that'll take, it'll, it'll still take a very long time before we have anything like that. But it's like we are currently at the forefront of the foundations being set for something like that. Uh, when the internet came, you know, it was a great uh, creation invention that helped people connect from all over the world, right? Like for us to be able to do this, it was unheard of, you know, um, before that. And but what was missing was the payment mechanism. And so it's taken about 30 years for us to get to the point of Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, really start to experiment with, okay, now can we actually start bringing in the payment aspect? Um, and so between gold and data, um, Bitcoin really leverages the data side. Um, it's not just about being a, a, a global payment system. It actually does a lot more, which uh, we are kind of working with companies in the background who are dealing with this, where data actually becomes something that is um, transacted in a way where you're, you're looking at like micropayments. Right, everything becomes monetized on the internet, but it provides value to pieces of data that you would never really think about uh, as, as having value before. So what this means is that like, if you started connecting smart sensors to like trees, right, to, to measure like their life or something, uh, you could actually then get like a, a value on the data of an entire forest to then present that to other groups to say, this is actually how much this forest um, is providing in terms of value. You know, if you're looking at an internet of things where everything is digitally connected and we're starting to translate the real world into the digital, all that data now has a, a value that you can actually present to other people. And we, you know, we've already seen this, like New Zealand, what I love about New Zealand is that they do things around the environment to give it rights, right? So they're giving, you know, forests and physical and environmental things rights. And we will see this in the digital world too. There will be digital property rights. Um, simultaneously, and all that has happened happening already, right? 
And so when that's when that when that begins, um, it just for me as a global citizen, it does sort of like break down barriers that we had before. Um, that and it, who knows, it might create new new barriers, um, right? Uh, that we haven't thought of yet. But uh, I really resonated with that idea of like some, something more global from a financial standpoint um, and where it's actually taking this global data too and turning it into something that uh, even now I don't think we can fathom what's going to be created in the next five to 10 years. So out of the two, huh, I, would say, I would say data for long term, but I would say gold if we have a, another serious economic crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I really see actually how different it can be. So I actually want to share with you guys a little a very unique case. So recently, somebody from who I used to work with, and I don't really, I don't dislike him, I don't hate him, but I've never been in a with a friendly kind of partnership with him. So when I first started this show, actually, he only the only thing that he says is that your show looks interesting, but it's too long, so I don't want to watch it. So to me, it's like okay, bye. So recently, he actually got back to me. He actually asked me, hey, can I be on your show? So I'm like, uh, okay, but do you have a multicultural background? He says, no, I don't have, but I just want to come to your show so that I can promote real estate in Singapore. So I just ignored the cloud. <laughs> but this is actually a positive thing in a sense for me because I now know is that, hey, actually, my show is getting traction. So now people want to come just to be able to do their own agenda. So that's really fun in a sense <laughs> but if in the past people will just assume that this is a bad thing because oh you know it's a bad publicity but hey good but any publicity works for me i guess as long as i'm not the one who does the negative things i guess <laughs> all right george so we are now actually uh in the fourth stage of business industry whereby there need to be an openness or a, a close relationship with our customer service, right? So how do you see the evolution of technology uh, in the future for one thing? So uh, maybe I can, if I can summarize it. So recently I watched the movie Social Media that actually tells the life of Mark Zuckerberg, etc. So he bench, I think the, the quote that I like there is, in the future we will live in the internet. So how do you agree with that? Um, I, can, I can see what he means by that. Uh, like exactly what I said, right? If we start digitizing everything in the physical world, um, just digitizing that, right? We could literally map everything here in the digital world. And I mean, it's already happening. We are kind of living in, on the internet in its right now. You know, like, you know, we're broadcasting this and then like digital representations of ourselves get stored on the internet and live on beyond us, right? So yep. in a way that like your digital self becomes its own sort of entity, living, breathing thing that gets interacted with and you're not necessarily being interacted with, right? Mm -hmm. I think the weirdest and most interesting thing is that people develop a relationship with your like online persona uh, to the point where, you know, sometimes when I meet people, they're like, hey, you know, um, I, I saw you on this. Like, I feel like I know everything about you, you know, and like, and I have no idea about them at all, you know? Yeah. Um, and so when, when he says that, I think there's truth to that. Um, I mean, it's already happening in a way, because a lot of in the things way, that- Kobe Bryant passed away, yeah. I think a lot of us felt, felt that a lot. Uh, I know you had a tough time with it, but I hope you're feeling that too, because I see a lot of your posts on him. Oh, yeah, man. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good, man. You know, it's like, it's one of those things where it's just, it's just sad, you know? And um, I, and I, I think that's a thing, one of the, the, the interesting benefits of uh, online social media, right, is that you do end up like developing relationships with either your heroes or people you look up, look up to, you know? Yeah. And uh, you may have never even met them, right? But, you know, they can provide a, a source of inspiration for you without needing to be physically around them, uh, which I think yeah. is just, just awesome. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 there is truth uh, to what Mark Zuckerberg has said. Um, but I think we must never forget like what it's like to be offline. You know, I think that's, there's a balance there, you know, all about harmony. Right. Um, yeah. and so with the online exposure, I think we, you, I think we will start to see actually more businesses coming out that actually promote, you know, people getting offline. So swinging back and I, I'm seeing that as well, right. There's like uh, digital detox programs happening now. 
Um, well-being, right, is a huge industry. It's all about like retreat centers and like disconnecting from the internet and what have you. So uh, that's already happening. That's already in motion. And I think that's just the natural laws uh, of our universe, right? Yin and yang constantly. You yeah. can never completely remove the other side. You know, and whenever I have to mention this part, I'm always thinking of Tron, like imagining like what it was like. All right. Yeah, no doubt. All right, brother. Uh, okay, so this is something I want to ask with regards to non-multicultural. So, I mean, you are you're fortunate enough that you come from a multicultural background of, uh, let me get it correct, right? Uh, Indian, Samoan, region to follow on, right? Of your parents, but you live in multiple parts of the world, so that's another story, which until now I can never remember. By the way, you have this third, I think, third, the highest number of countries that you've lived in among my guests. The highest, I think, is 12. Craziness. Yeah. All right, brother. So with regards to non-multicultural, non yeah, how would you advise somebody who may not have experienced the life that you have lived in to actually establish a a kind of relationship like for example maybe a lot of tck tend to date somebody that is from their host country it's because well that's the most easy uh, available i guess but from track records not only for other people i can testify for myself we don't have a good track record in that so what would you advise on that bro man that's such a good point um ah uh, yeah you know it's tough man like uh unless you're like you are displaced uh it's hard because it's interesting right i've also had um you know some of my exes they they might have had multicultural parents right but they yeah. might have been born and raised in one country right so they are still more from that host country than they yeah. are with their their parents stuff um so there's there i guess there's a mindset to it as well you know you got to be open because i have met some I've met a couple couples where one one of them was you know had come from like uh, the the farms of uh, the the farm areas of uh, Australia right but he was so open to learning his partner's culture you know it, it worked you know they made it work um, and so it's not impossible uh, but yeah to be fair I think even for me in the past unfortunately it hasn't been uh, too successful dating someone who's not a TCK to understand like our need one to roam we tend to uh, we have a tendency to want to just be moving right yeah um, it doesn't mean that we like uh, don't have focus or are always restless it's more about like we just need to feel like there's a sense of movement because um, as I said you know like Singapore's uh, for me I, I can still get that same uh, desire met by just you know going to the local museum right or going to like networking events and meeting with other you know potential tck's or whatnot um so it doesn't always have to be about physically moving but there is that tendency there for us like if we aren't traveling every so often um we can get restless yeah yeah can you imagine now i'm stuck in indonesia because of the corona <laughs> So yep. yeah, I get, I get I can relate to that. I've been wanting to be back in Singapore, but I've been having at least three delays now, so that sucks. Uh, all right, brother. Uh, okay, so <coughs> sorry about that. Okay, so with regards to career, right? Uh, I know that you actually used to deal in arts and animations before before this, right? Do you feel a career for TCK that is more inclined towards creative purpose is more meaningful or something that will fill them much more as compared to those with greater monetary gain? Because I always feel that TCK tend to strive for something that allows us to innovate. In fact, even though I myself and my usual career is in property, I do this thing is because it allows me to express my way of speaking. So what about you? What do you feel? Do you agree to that? Yeah, I think we definitely always need that balance. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my career history has been very diverse. And I've noticed a lot of TCKs do find themselves uh, doing something related to, like, to some humanitarian cause or helping others out. Like, a lot of my friends, like, mo a lot of them are in, like, the United Nations or some nonprofit or, you know, some, some other organization, right, humanitarian, uh, something to do with the world. Um, so that's not a surprise. 
And yeah. yeah, so when it comes to the career side, hmm, it depends on like the, the point in time you're at. Like if you're in your 20s, I would say like, you know, just try as many things as you can. Um, you know, do different careers, roles, it doesn't matter. But like do that so that you are able to get a better sense of like what you're really passionate about. Um, and then, yeah, by the time I hit my 30s, I, I really understood like what I wanted to focus on for the next decade. Um, and that, that was the community stuff, right? And, and it was so, it was, it was perfect because new types of roles are coming out that are breaking the mold of like traditional roles. And so with community, there were community managers coming out and it's just like a, another fancy name to like bring together different areas, right? It could be like sales, marketing operations, HR, like literally everything. Um, but it's like that blanket of just communities in general, you're overseeing them. Uh, a friend of mine uh, kind of defined community managers as like being the CEO without the financial responsibility, <laughs> which I was like, yeah, but that's a good, that's a good point. Um, that's a good point, actually. <laughs> yeah, because it's true. And like, because that can be a good thing and a bad thing, right? Because you are overseeing so many different areas. You have to know everything, right? But then at the same time, uh, you don't have the financial stressors, right, of being a CEO. Um, yeah. So yeah, I thought that was pretty accurate. And, and last night we had a, a future of work event at one of our clients uh, site so draper startup house which was tribe theory previously um yep. highly recommended because there's a whole bunch of tck's that go through that door that's where you yeah. know we met right like in fact, uh, my Josh and I met, and in fact a lot of us actually met there and yeah. at least there's four people including santa bremer who is actually the, the sister-in-law of draper starter house correct correct so yeah vikram would definitely be another guy um to, to get on the show um, but yeah, he's, yeah. Vikram is the, is the founder for, for Tribe Theory, which is now Draper Startup House. And um, I just actually connected uh, him with another TCK of mine who was actually my previous boss for a co-working space in Australia. I didn't find okay. out that he was a TCK as well, like until later. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, again, like we all seem to find each other somehow. <laughs> Very interesting how the world works, isn't it? <laughs> it's a small world after all. Yeah, and with how, with how much technology has already impact, impacted us, it allows that world to become even smaller. And well, that is one of the main things that I'm really proud of my show is because now people can get to see what it's like to live on the other side of the world as compared to just, I want to come in and then I have to strive through learning everything from start to zero. I think parents who are expatriates have to experience a lot of hardship on this is because they have to unlearn everything that they learn in order to learn something new and at the same time they start to maintain the balance on that all right uh all right brother so okay my point was though have you ever felt insecure about your appearance i mean earlier you mentioned like you were in a tech conference where by you and another another gentleman of color is actually the only ones among the white guys and then have you ever felt insecure about it when you were young the reason why I ask this is because I've been seeing a lot of posts that is on body image and appearances. In fact, one of my past guests, uh, Marjan, who is actually a Filipino who was raised in Taiwan and is now living in the United States, used to say that he used to not like to go outside, even though he's actually a big fan of playing basketball up. And in Taiwan, well, the court is outdoors. So he doesn't like to go outside because he knows he'll get darker and he's really insecure about his skin color when he was younger. Uh, have you ever experienced that, bro? And what would you advise to somebody who is experiencing that, especially at a young age? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my, hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, if <laughs> being honest, uh, I actually rejected probably my Indian side um, when I was younger because it just wasn't cool, you know, to be like, um, to be Indian. Like the stereotypes that would come with being Indian um, is, you know, Apu from The Simpsons, right? And like, oh, oh, no. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And just the accent and everything. And then, um, but as I, as I got older, you know, I learned, I learned to accept that side of me, right? And like to look at, look at the strengths of that. Um, and, you know, now... Uh, yeah, I don't have that issue um, because, and especially because I was so much closer to my Polynesian side, you know, I took my more pride in that. But um, and I think maybe because like my, my my father too, like in many ways he didn't really 
he got he we wanted all of us to speak English. So there's a bit of rejection of that too, because I think maybe he was more worried about us not being able to assimilate into a a country like Australia. And so I think he had to, you know, he gave up a lot and had to do a lot in order to um, migrate as well. You know, I think every migrant um, knows that story of uh, assimilation. You know, it's not easy. Um, so, yeah, definitely appearance-wise, you know, I would hate it when people would say that, like, oh, you look Indian or, like, Pakistani or Sri Lankan or something like that, right? Um, but then I realized over time, like, people would call me all different types of nationalities, you know, after that. As I started moving around and traveling, you know, people would then like say, "Oh, you look Brazilian. Oh, you look like uh, Puerto Rican. Oh, you look Mexican. Oh, you know, like." I think, I used to, I think when I met you for the first time, I said you look like James Harden. Something. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, and, and what's crazy? What's crazy is that, like, yeah, I remember, like, because there was one time where I got like cornrows, and then people yeah. thought I was, uh, they thought I was African American. I was like, nah, I'm not. Um, but I think that comes with like. The mixes and then like just being culturally ambiguous so again at the end of the day um you know i learned to be okay with my roots you know be okay with the the indian side and then my polynesian side you know I, I then started to embrace like hey my indian side my my indian side were known to be pretty smart you know so i'm like all right i'll take that um and yeah you know it just became i was insecure about that but now i don't give a fuck like oh sorry sorry if i swore on your show but no you know, please like, please the do swear on your show it's fine uh, yeah. They say that those who swear more is the one who is more smarter. No, I, or, I don't know. Or something along the line. I mean, I myself swear, and, but this is my show, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, um, it's like, I mean, I care. I care about people. Yeah. I think. Um, it, when it, as only, I guess that applies when I'm talking about, like, you know, uh, being true to who you are and like, you know, being able to make your own decisions and not giving into things like peer pressure and, and what have you. Um, you know, there's, you, you feel it though, you do feel it, right? When, if you are in another country where you see, uh, you don't see your, I guess, skin color or um, nationality around, right? Uh, you know, if you go to like, say places like Japan, right? In the outskirts, like if you just see all Japanese and you're like the only brown guy there, um, you'll stand out, you know? But I always try to look at like, you know, human to human, what's most important. Be kind, be nice, learn, be willing to learn. Um, the only thing that I will, will push back against is if there's like intentional racism. Um, yeah. You know, luckily I haven't, had, I haven't had to face a lot of that like constantly, right? But I have experienced it. And I'm not for that because I have also seen it with, you know, other friends of mine. And uh, yeah, that to me is just one of the things I, will stand against, you know, because um, it just like boggles my mind in 2020 if um, people still have that mindset, you know, um, and I think for most TCKs, they'd understand that. Yeah. All right. I actually have one last question for you, brother. So I want you to imagine that you're back to when you're 20s. Uh, I'm not going to tell people your age, don't worry about that, but come on, man, we already know that. So. Uh, I want you to imagine back in your 20s or even to younger to when you're teens, yeah. So if you can talk to him, what three advice or three pieces of advice? It could be you can also tell them what book you would tell them to read or what you have advice, like such as explore a lot of different stuff. What would you give to a younger George? And well, uh, maybe you keep in mind that this is one thing that to give to a younger TCK or maybe somebody who is younger. To what would you advise to them in order to to face life ahead? Remember who you are. Um, there is a uh, from the Lion King, right? There's that scene yeah. where Simba's uh, right uh, running after uh, Mufasa in the clouds, and that scene always gets me because that really like resonated with me in terms of just my identity for myself. I think the biggest thing for TCKs is identity. And remembering who you are is like to accept all of you, right? To accept that like you do not have to just be one piece, you know, for um, your, 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 your family, your whoever, right? Like you have to learn to accept all of you. Um, and I think that is, you know, to be proud of like your mixes, to be proud of the fact that you, you do stand out, uh, to be proud that, that you don't have to necessarily fit in because the world is big and it is small at the same time. Like your crew is out there. Um, 
if you find yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by people who don't get you, maybe you're just in the wrong place, you know? Indeed, and, indeed. and the internet is here, you know? Like, start Googling, start finding out, you know, where your people are at. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say that, you know, remember who you are, be proud of um, all of you. Yep. Uh, anything else on that, brother? Or that's the best, that's the only advice you feel like? <laughs> Well, I do have um, my famous saying, uh, to patience and persistence, it will come. Uh, the Tuvaluan translation is ten aloe fanatu. And um, yeah, that's sort of like the last thing I would uh, leave for everyone is, you know, yeah, be patient, um, yet persistent. And whatever it is that, you know, you're seeking or looking for, it will come. All right. Okay, that's actually my all my questions for uh, George. Uh, first off, I need to give a shout out to all these individuals who like this comment. So, first is Mr. Ian Nicholas Sharma. Uh, also we uh, we kindly remember him as Nick. He's Annie's boss. Uh, Mr. Ben Vogel, who is actually one of my past guests. Ben has been really supportive of this community, for one. And he is one of the few TCK who actually marry a non TCK. However, they are in a really happy marriage. The reason being is that his wife was a household travel. So, Good to you, Ben. Uh, Nikhil, who is actually my junior, glad that you're watching this, and Madam Yoman, who is uh, who is a colleague of mine. So, with that, that's the end of my show. Uh, for those of you who, are, who may still have time, uh, yeah, I am actually creating a new article that I'm going to post with Learn Culture Thoughts. It's called Two Sides of the Coin. I'm actually just doing the draft, and I'll be doing it throughout this weekend, and hopefully, I can release it soon. Uh, George, do you have anything? Uh, okay, first off, is I need to apologize because I'm not in Singapore. I really actually want to attend the first night of house event. So, anything you want to say on that, brother? Yeah, all good, all good, brother. Um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, I mean, last things, don't have anything um, else to say except for thank you uh, for having me on the show and, um, you know, keep it up. Uh, yeah, be persistent with this. And, you know, I think it's very important for, uh, other TCKs. I always kind of put it like with the mutants, right? We're like X-Men and uh, Professor X like going and recruiting all the all the mutants to let them know that, hey, you know, be different. It's okay. <laughs> but we still oh, got to like... Fact, uh, Professor X and Magneto is based on both Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Yeah. Ah, yeah, they were, yeah, they were based on that it's because their ideology of the African-American race at that time. So... Yeah, that's actually the inspiration for our those two. <laughs> Pretty cool, Man, right? That makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Wow. Yeah. It really does imagine how life and fiction actually relate. <laughs> All right. That's the end of Global Citizens, episode 31. Uh, I might, uh, the next episode, will, I believe, is on next Tuesday. So do keep look out for it. Thanks so much, George. Uh, just to let you guys know, I really appreciate all of my past guests so far. but. George is actually one of the very first person I would love to invite to the show, but at that time was due to a lot of scheduling issues. We can't really agree on the timing, so finally I get him in. So thanks a lot, buddy. Anytime, man. All right, see you, brother. I'll see you in Singapore soon. See ya. See ya. Bye.